team here, uh, or at once yet separate, employs artist collaboration and the work of Leslie Scalapino with Conrad Steiner, Peter Coyne, and Marina Adams, and moderated by Charles Bernstein. Um, it is very important to us in the project to add to Leslie's legacy by creating space to have conversations about the many facets of her work. Um, so I just want to give out a heartfelt thank you to Tracy Brunel, Tom White, and the Leslie Scalapino Old Books Fund for supporting this panel tonight. Um, we wouldn't be doing this without them. So. Um, as you can see, that we have a wine table in the back, so I invite you all to uh, have a drink while we listen to this work. Um, we also have commemorative postcards that were uh, featuring Leslie's work that were designed by Edwin Torres and letterpress uh, printed after <coughs> Oosa, and those are on the back, and we're offering them as a free gift for everyone here tonight. So please, front of the book table, please grab one. And um, there's a really great array of Leslie's books back there uh, at a really nice price, so I suggest everybody. Uh, gather, gather up some books, and uh, maybe buy a poetry project to look back with them at the event. Quick announcement, I know Conrad will probably talk about this, but his film, Way, will be shown tomorrow at Anthology Film Archive down the street, two showings at 7 and 9 p.m. Um, so uh, please think about going to see that. It features Leslie's uh, text, Way, his netbook, Way, is on sale there for $5. Um, and Conrad produced and directed it. And uh, with that, let me uh, turn over the microphone to Charles Bernstein. So it's great to be here to honor the work of Leslie Scalpino and her collaborators. Just uh, to be formal and to tell you something about Leslie Scalpino, for those who may not know, she died on May 28, 2010. She was born in 1944. She was the author of 30 books of poetry, prose, intergenre fiction, plays, and essays. In the year that she died, 2010, she published five books, The Dihedron's Gazelle, Dihedral's Zoom, from Post Apollo, Flow, Wing, Crocodile, and A Pair of Actions Are Erased, The Pier, from Chax Press, two plays in one volume. The animal is in the world like water in water from Granary Books. I'll come back to that in a minute. And a collaboration uh, between, which is a collaboration between uh, Leslie and Kinky Smith. And Flo's Horse Flo's or Horse Books from Start Your Own Books. She also received, it at that same time, she published a second edition of Crowd and Not Evening or Light from her own old books, the fantastic series that uh, she was the publisher of. It's Go In Horizontal, her selected poems, 74 to 2006, 2006 was published at University of California Press at Berkeley in 2008. It's the starting point, really, for those who want to learn about Leslie's work. A revised and expanded version of her essay book how Phenomena Appear to Unfold was published by Litmus Press and Tracy Purnell, who organized this event uh, in May 2011. And it's a phenomenal book. It has a cover by Peter Coyne, which we'll see a couple of different times. There's a website, lesliescalapino.com, and <coughs> Penn Sound's Leslie Scalapino page includes a very rich collection of her sound recordings, so you can access her work that way, as well as all of her early books, her first five books, are on the line digitally. So we're going to have the three uh, artists who collaborated to, with her speak, and I'll introduce all, all three. Uh, this uh, is the book flow of all of her covers. Uh, and it, Keita Coyne will be the first, her most recent solo exhibition, Everything That Rises must converge was held at uh, Mass MoCA, the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, 2010 to 2011. She was born in Oklahoma City and currently lives in New York. 
Park, and is represented by Gallery Long. Um, she did a talk at Naropa just a couple of weeks ago. Is that not right? Did it happen? It did not happen. It was supposed to happen, and here would be the closest thing to it. How a poet and sculptor cross paths. Well, that will be your subject for tonight. Um, so we get the scoop in New York. We get those people in Boulder. Um, her book from Post Apollo 2002 uh, was called It's Go in Quiet Illumined Grass. Twenty years ago, I ended an essay on the then emerging digital environments with this remark. But I don't want to talk about computers, but objects, objects enduring in the face of automation. I picture here a sculpture by Peter Coyne, uh, from Peter Coyne's April 1994 show at the Jack Shaneman Gallery, which featured candelabra-like works hung from the ceiling and dripping with layers of white wax. For it has never been the object of art to capture the thing itself, but rather the conditions of thingness its thickness, its intractability, its untranslatability or unreproducibility, its linguistic or semiotic density, opacity, particularity and peculiarity, its complexity. And in those 20 years since, I've seen equally astounding works. She's one of my favorite artists, and I'm so thrilled uh, to be introducing her here. Marina Adams is a painter who lives in New York and also in Parma, Italy. Uh, she has had sole exhibitions at Ionis Gallery, Gallery Gris, the Q Art Foundation, and Magazzino d'Arte Moderna in Rome. Currently, she has a painting on view at the great Coming Together Surviving Sandy show curated by Colin Guia in Industry City in Brooklyn. I urge you all to go out there to Sunset Park to see that great show. Adams is a visiting critic of art at the Rhode Island School of Design and has taught at the Brooklyn Borough Manhattan Community College in CUNY, Woodbury College, Rutgers, and Pratt. She frequently collaborates with poets. God knows why we have to ask her <laughs> why she would do such a thing. Including Teorema with Vincent Katz, the tango, which we'll talk about, her wonderful 2001 collaboration with Scalpino, and View Sur Mer with Christian Prichant, and In Our Own Backyard, 2006, and New Alphabet with Warm call. Her next book collaboration is titled Actuality is also with Norm Cole, and it'll be published by Lipless Press, again, Tracy Brown's Press. You've already heard that Conrad Steiner will have a show at the Anthology Film Archives tomorrow night of this film, which Norman Fisher said was one of the best films he had seen of any kind. And uh, no doubt he's prejudiced because I don't know how much he loves Leslie Scalapino's work, but even so. Since 1981, Conrad Steiner has made short non-narrative works. His films are distributed by Canyon Cinema in San Francisco. Since 2000, his work has increasingly involved the cinematic composition of narration, music, and montage in collaboration with musicians and poets. He's worked with John Raskin, the composer of Rova, Matt Ingalls, uh, San Francisco uh, uh, Sound, New Music Ensemble, and Graham Kona, AKA Big Band Leader Ted Brinkley, and with poets Scalpino, Carl Harriman, Steve Benson, Stephanie Young, and Brent Cunningham. In 2003, he brought together poets and film in a long project, dubbed Neo Benchy, even here in this very room, we had a version of Neo Benchy on the court fire. Many people were doing it uh, in different places. It's an admiration and nod to the original Benchy narrators of Japanese silent films. The poet stands next to the film, narrates uh, the, the film in very interesting structure. In 2007, he produced, uh, I think it's great, by the way, the uh, English language bootlegs of Guy Debord's great feature length films that Debord himself wanted to destroy, but uh, didn't because they were too much spectacle. So we, he's actually produced an English, not a dub, but an English language version. Uh, of, of those works because the, uh, there's so much text already in the, in, in, in the film itself. In 2012, a collaborative film narration project with Carl Harriman was completed, and in the same year, the feature-length collaborative film project with Leslie Way was completed, and as you know, it'll be tomorrow night an anthology film archive. Um, on Penn Sound, you'll see two incredible um, videos 
of Leslie Sig and Conrad right next to him in, in the house that, the, that Tom and Leslie shared uh, very late in her life, just shortly before she died. And they're beautiful uh, um, video realizations of Leslie Scalapino from reading her work and available to see. Uh, it's, uh, I'm very grateful to uh, Leslie and, and, uh, and Conrad for, for making those very powerful, just incredible ways Scalapino work read in this flowing way. Um, so this, uh, I just been given the, the book, The Apples in the World, like water in water. Uh, there's now a trade edition uh, published by Compline Press and available for sale. This uh, otherwise uh, uh, rare granary book. There is the pages of this actually in how phenomena appear to unfold. Uh, and that, this is, is taken from that. Kiki is not here. Uh, but I uh, just wanted to read what it was this idea of this beautiful implication of this collaboration between the two of them. The, the text here is How can, do, we have any relation to anything to be neither higher nor lower than anything else, than anything outside is? So that's just that one still. You can see the whole of book here. Um, it's a key work for her. In a related essay, Scalpino discusses the serial poetics of this work. My poem sequence is to re-estate, restate experiencing in space the mind eye making estimations, approximations as concepts that are the same as their being in space. The language makes minute distinctions of its theme and treats these as spatial. For example, the poem segments posit Society not based on emulation, no individual regarded as higher than another, and posit the individual perceiving in such a way, not having such feelings or behavior or emulation or sense of imminence, though the segments posit the individual is aware that others do, different from an animal's view. These concepts in the world, however, are not submitted to space. In the world, concepts of feeling such as peoples in societies feeling social values, having internalized these, are not submitted to this sense of space, of no hierarchy. Here they are submitted to space, of no hierarchy, to be translated to a sense of free space, shape, place. Activity is the only community, Scalapino writes, in the radical nature of experience on Whale and Jenny and Howe and herself. The conservative gesture, always a constant, any ordering, institutional and societal, is to view both activity and time per se as a condition of tradition. As such, both time and activity are a lost mass at any time. My focus is on non-hierarchical structure in writing, for example, the implications of time as activity, the future being in the past and present, these times separate and going on simultaneously, equally active, in reference to Whalen's writing and similar to Dogen's conception of time and being, suggest a non-hierarchical structure in which all times exist at once and occur as activity without excluding each other. This is unrelated to social power. It can possibly transcend it, but is related to social intelligibility at some time. Social marginality is a state not producing necessarily, but related to thought form as discovery. I wanted to end with Leslie's fantastic voice and thought.
most artists listen to jazz or music, but I listen to words. And words, um, other poets or, or books on tape, and sometimes I'll just stop and just listen to the words, or I'll re-listen to the words. And uh, I don't write, I'm, I just bungle when I write. And when uh, curators ask me to write things about my work, I just am paralyzed with fear. I mean, often, even when you're in these museum shows, they're asking you to write word text and stuff now, and I'm just paralyzed. I, I just hate to write because I know what great writing is. And um, all my work is from great writers. All my work is about great writers. And um, uh, I just, I listen to words, and that is what my work is about. And um, Leslie and I met at Bard. Uh, we were both professors there, and of course I was the visual artist, and she was for writing, and we became immediate friends. And we had to do uh, lectures about our work, and I remember Leslie came, and she sat in the front row, and she brought her pillows because of her back and what have you. And many of you probably know Leslie, and uh, she was a Buddhist, and uh, as you know, uh, Buddhists have great senses of humor. And she sat in the front row, and she just giggled through the whole lecture. Everyone else was very serious. And um, you can take your work very seriously, but you can also see great humor in, in your work, I think, because usually when you do work very seriously, it always turns around to bite you in the butt, I think. Um, and um, when I went, uh, the Rockefellers gave me um, six months to just wander in Japan, which was a great, great gift. And all I did was read and wander. I didn't do anything. And um, I just read, and it's, it's, it was truly a great gift to have. And I wandered up to uh, Koyasan, I don't know, I'm sure some of you have been there. It was, it's a great um, a Buddhist uh, mountain. And when I arrived there, it was about noontime, and uh, all of a sudden, all of these monks just came out of nowhere. They were just running, and they were all running, and they ran towards all these trees. And you've never seen anything like it. There must have been close to a thousand of them. And, you know, I had just gotten off this, like, little tiny cable car, and I was by myself, and, and they were running everywhere, and they were running to the trees, and they prayed in four directions, north, south, east, west, and there was a camera crew following them, and I thought, what a great opportunity. I drop my bags, I pull out my camera, and I start following them. I'm chasing them, the camera crew's chasing them. We're, we're running after them into the woods, and I didn't know where I was going, but I felt like, well, what do I have to lose, right? And um, you can hit the next slide. And, um, and they were, they, they, we followed them for about a half an hour, and then, like, like magic, they were all gone. And I'm standing in this, middle of this forest, the camera crew's gone, the, the monks are all gone, and I'm standing there with the camera crew, I'm thinking, where the hell am I, right? And it's pitch black, and it's noon, and because the mountains are very tall, and all, or, and the um, trees are very tall, and there's not, this is noontime, this is how dark it is there. And if you've ever been there, it's where all the very, very high monks high monks, the very holy monks are, are buried, right? And um, there's a light for every monk that's buried, and that they keep burning. It's really beautiful. There's also a light that's never been put out for um, uh, since 1100. And um, I, I, it was hard to find even where my luggage was, um, but I did. And then I heard that um, at noon and at midnight, that, uh, that this occurs. So at 11.30 at night, I'm waiting for these monks. And, and at midnight, here come all these monks again. And I'm like, great, I'm there with my camera equipment. I followed them, a half an hour later, they're gone. I'm like, okay, noon, I'm out there, I'm ready with my camera equipment. Three days I did this, right? On the third day, they asked me to please leave. <laughs> okay, so I leave. So um, the next slide, Leslie asked me if she could use this image for her book cover, and of course I, I was honored, I was so flattered, and um, that was the first of our collaborations. We actually, I think, did about eight collaborations, and I won't show you all of them, I'll just show you a few of my favorite. 
Um, you can do, do the next one. This was one of my favorite. It was a very conscious collaboration. She came to my studio and she said, let's do, let's do a collaboration. What do you want to do it on? And one of my favorite subjects is hell. You know, I love the idea of hell um, because everybody wants to go to heaven, right? But I think it'll be much more fun, you know, to go to hell. If you look at all the great Catholic images, you know, like heaven is so, you know, kind of boring, you know, everybody's very proper. But hell looks really interesting, you know, in all the Catholic images. And so I said, let's, let's do that. Liz is like, oh, no, not hell, Peter. You know, I think hell would be very hard. And I said, oh, no, no, let's do hell. She's like, oh, do you really want to do hell? I said, yes, I really want to do hell. All right, and, and, but Leslie takes things very seriously, and so she went back and she started to write the manuscript, and so she started to send me these things, and it's all in this book, and this stuff was really intense that she began to send me, and so you can show the next slide. And I thought, oh, she really knows about hell. And so I thought, oh, Lord, I'm in trouble. The first time these manuscripts started to come. And so I began, I mean, it started to sweat up here. I remember when I first started to get those manuscripts, um, they were so intense that I thought, oh, shit, I'm in over my head. So. The first thing I did was take what I felt was one of the most valuable things, which was my great-grandmother's pearls. I had really, it was the only thing I really wanted so much from my family. And so it was the only thing they really ever gave me, which was my great-grandmother's pearls. And I buried them here in this piece. And it was the thing that I valued the most. And I thought by burying this in this piece that 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 would be like an omen. Okay, if I bury this and I call it descent into hell, it would put me kind of closer. I'm giving up what I, what I love the most. Will I be closer to hell? Will I feel the pain that she's writing about here in hell? But it wasn't. It wasn't even near the words that she was writing about. And we talked about all different kinds of issues. She would write, I would call her and say, Leslie, I can't get close to this stuff. She said, keep trying. I said, look, okay, thank you. And so, <laughs> so um, uh, Alice Notley wrote on the back, um, uh, she wrote, and it, this was an enlightened work, singing of death, singing of death, um, physical pain, social fearfulness, and where, when, or whether one even is. Do the next slide. I tried so hard with this work, and I mean, I worked 24 7 on it. My assistants began to really not like Leslie so much. And when the fax machine, this was still when we were using faxes, would come across and be like, oh no. And so I tried really hard. You know how the monks, uh, not the monks, the, the priest, when the, um, when the bishops, I think it's the bishops, the cardinals, excuse me. The cardinals, when they get their hats and they and they die, they have they they uh, they take the ropes and they pound them onto the uh, roof of the church. They have a couple up at Saint um, Patrick's up up town, and when the ropes rot, they fall to the ground, and they're supposed to just be swept up and pushed away, and that's to let everybody know that. They too are human, and they too someday will die. So I did a couple of these um, hats descending. The next slide, and um, I kept trying to get closer to hell because at this church, this time the church was going through all this upheaval. Next slide, and I tried to make darkness envelop some of my work against the light. This is all wax, by the way, very fragile, uh, delicate pieces. Next slide. I tried to make the frozen hells that Dante talks about when you go descends into hell. But it was, next slide. And I tried to make these scatter pieces where you had to get down on your knees to actually see the figures. Next slide. And then you can see the faces. This one's called Buddha Boy. Next slide. 
I made these really big pieces that are just dripped with wax. And I call this a Chinese wall because it looks a lot like the scripts of the walls. And if you go around to the back side, which I don't have a slide of, and you look up inside, you can actually see faces or figures inside of it. But you have to look really hard. And a lot of pieces, people even miss it. Um, this was all done in a show where Leslie came and she read parts of her epic poem here. And every time I read this or reread it, it's like reading it at the first time. I hope you really read this. It's, it's an incredible, incredible poem. And it's, it continues to feed me. Even after we had this show and Leslie came and read and we had a shakuhachi player come and read, which was so eerie. The place was packed when we did that. It was such a beautiful um, exhibition and such a beautiful reading that she did. Um, I continued to work with this because I felt I never got, I never got the depth of what she got in her poem. I, I, this was her subject matter. Next. I, I did these screens, these screens, I tried to make these screens that you could look through, and it just was not working. So I actually shifted my color tone. I thought maybe if I made them look burnt, that that would be closer. Next slide. So I went to these very dark black images and thought that that might work. Next slide. And then I made these things scatter so that they would look like they were going across the ocean and that the, that the figures would be um, losing parts of them. Next slide. And the front parts of them, they would have these tassels being in front of their faces. Next slide. Um, and I made them look like they would be growing branches out of their heads so that, uh, because in parts of the poem, you can get the feeling of that. Next slide. Still the faces were so tiny and they were being enveloped by these, by these images that, that is parts of these poems. Next slide. At parts they collapse, which is talked about in here. Next slide. And in, and in parts they have the feelings of these little tiny animals that are captured within them. And I, I found all these dumb, you know, a lot of these museums are giving up these animals. Um, like no one is interested in going to these natural history museums anymore. So for a while they were dumping these beautiful birds in dumpsters and I was finding them. And so I used to rescue them and I put them in these, in these pieces. And, and now, I did it so often that now a lot of these natural history museums are calling me and offering these birds to me. And so I, they're in a lot of my work. Next slide. This one even had a lady standing at the top. This is 13 feet tall. And I make her so that she cries three times a day. And if you catch her at just the right moment, her tears go onto the pavement and you see her. But even within that hole at the bottom of her, Next slide. You can see they have birds that are fighting and uh, tossing within the within the piece. Next slide. I had a lot of birds that would dive into pieces because um, I felt like maybe that would be good enough. Next. And they would come out the other side because I thought that that would be a beautiful way to get the feeling of it. But nothing ever seemed good enough. It just wasn't as rich or as powerful. It was very frustrating. I never worked on a collaboration directly with her again. <laughs> Next slide. I made roses or made petals of these big, big sheets. I mean, maybe. Uh, 14 feet long with chandeliers above them. Um, they had close to 3,000 roses dipped in wax. Next slide. Finally, I surrendered. Um, and I went to a field, um, a, an apple orchard, and I was thought I was making a tree for Flannery O'Connor. And uh, I started to skin. Uh, they After, I think it's 20 years, they um, take uh, the apple trees 
in apple orchards, and they kill them. They kill certain segments. And um, so I was uh, going to get this tree from this apple grower. And um, we were skinning it. You skin the trees, and that's where all the bugs are. And um, that's when Leslie called me and told me that she was very ill. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to make this tree for you. And we're going to work really hard to see if we can get you healthy again. And she said, I've been thinking about a tree. I've been thinking about a tree for the cover of my next book. And I said, well, I've been thinking about a tree for my book cover, too. And we'll make sister covers. And we'll call them Peace Scalopino Nushu. And Nushu is a private language between two women. And it's, it's a secret language that the Chinese use. And Leslie and I always had this kind of language. She often sent me drafts of her poems. And then I would send her images back, or we would just talk about them. She never expected me to write much to her. I, I'm a terrible writer. I'm just an awful writer. And, and, um, but I, I, I could always try to make things with my hands, because that was where I came, that's where I come from. And um, so I, I started to make this tree for Leslie. And I got all these peacocks. Peacocks are about transformation. And I was so hoping that the transformation for her would be from sickness to health. But we both also knew that it might be from this life to the next. But we prayed, I know, so hard that it would be from sickness to health. And I bought the most beautiful peacocks. The peacocks have to be very old for me to get them. They have to be about 12 or 13 years. And they have to die in January or in August. And they have to, you can see by their faces that they have to be elderly. And so all these peacocks we gathered. And then, um, you can do the next slide. Um, all the soy pheasants I put out there. The soy pheasants are usually given to gods. And I got all these soy pheasants for her because I was hoping the gods would munch on the soy pheasants and not on her body. And so I was really trying to tempt them. They're beautiful, they're iridescent, and that was my way of tempting the gods. It's the first time that I ever felt that I would not finish a project. And I could see as I was getting closer and closer to the deadline, I could see I, I was not going to finish this project. And my assistants were really getting irritated with me because I was pushing them so hard. And so they had a mini revolt and said they, unless I painted the tree, they would not finish it. And I wanted to black sand it, which is a really difficult process. It means that you paint it on the, with glue and you spoon it on. And this is a big tree and you have to do that seven times. And they said they wouldn't do it. And so I said, fine. Um, I'm Irish. I'm very stubborn. Um, so I called all my old assistants. And my oldest assistant you know, worked for me when they were really young. And they now are married. And they have children in college. That's how old my oldest assistants are. And I called them all back, and including their children, and all my art friends, and my neighbors who are chefs. I called everybody I knew. Please come help me. I've never done this before. And they came. They came from other states. They slept on the floors of my studio. And we worked for a month for 24-7. And we finished just in time. And, and barely. Because spooning that onto this big tree, and um, it was a huge job. And you can show the last slide. You can see the soy pheasants, which are so beautiful. But we finished. <coughs> And the opening was May 28th, 2010, the day Leslie died, um, unbeknownst to me. Um, but it was a beautiful opening, and I think uh, that Leslie was sitting on the top of the tree, uh, enjoying the festivities. Um, there was, a, I think, a huge bond uh, in many ways. Uh, I think sometimes these things are in cycles, and some ways things are known that we don't know. Um, but that tree was for Leslie. And um, you can show the next slide. Um, I made one more collaboration. 
Oh, this was the book cover. This was uh, my book cover, and you can show the next one. And this was Leslie's book cover, and his sister book covers. And the next slide. I wanted to do one more piece. This was post-collaboration. Leslie lives in my studio. I feel her all the time. I pick up books all the time, and I can hear Leslie's voice. And I felt very strongly that I had to do one more piece with Leslie. And uh, uh, this was a portrait of Tom, her husband, and Leslie. They're the two white peacocks. I did all white birds. I did a lot of albino birds. Um, and you can do the next slide. And I did one albino squirrel that irritated Leslie and Tom a lot in the backyard. And um, uh, I love the one white bird that looks down on them. Um, it's a small, it started out a small piece. It grew, uh, Leslie told me it needed to be very large and big, and it now weighed 1,200 pounds. Um, we showed it at the, we finished it barely in time. It went to uh, Miami. It sold within five minutes of the opening, and I told the person, I'm really sorry, it has to go back to my studio for at least a year. It ha you know, I haven't lived with it long enough. Um, there's uh, one more slide, I think, um, this, and one more after that. I love the I love the birds in the piece. The colors are all uh, Leslie's colors, uh, and someone so interestingly said at the opening that that it looked like a bruised skin the colors, which I thought were so beautiful. I pick up books all the time, and I'll just leave you with this quote. Uh, Leslie and I shared the love of Japanese film and Japanese writing. We read everything that was translated. Um, and uh, I picked up this book just the day that I finished uh, this piece. And it says, Japanese literature is often about nothing happening because Japanese life is too. The more intense the emotion, the more regular the meter. The fewer words smoke, spoken, the easier it is to believe you're standing on common ground. Thank you for listening.